One minute remaining. These three words trigger a fascinating shift in many multiplayer matches. Before this point, mistakes aren't so bad since players have a lot of time to catch up, but now, everything changes. Mistakes can be devastating because you don't have time to fix them. For the losing team, this might be their final shot, and they better make it count. This is a time for last ditch efforts and heroic final stands. Scarcity of opportunity drives desperation. Players will do whatever it takes to pull out the win because they cannot afford to do nothing. What I find really fascinating about the final minute of gameplay is how the mechanics don't change, but the player's utilization of the mechanics and systems does. Player behavior is emergent and influenced by dynamic factors in and outside of the game. People don't want to let their team down, so the stakes are raised to their peak. In this final moment, you can find desperation, hubris, failure, success, it's all there. In a way, we're all stuck in our own final minutes, running around trying to leave an impact and living the full range of the human experience with the knowledge that sooner time will run out. Go out there and make your final minutes count. My favourite spaces in games are often the cosiest. Virtual environments can present this feeling of comfort in a few ways too. I often find that there is a sense of warmth that comes from spaces that are filled out. This can be with objects and decorations, or even living beings too. Bedrooms or starter rooms always feel relaxing because of that homeliness they possess, but also because they tend to be at the beginning of your journey. Colour can also have a profound effect on the cosy ambience of a game by utilising calming colour palettes and lighting. The orange hues of the evening and sunlight leaking through the leaves of a dense forest or a bedroom window greatly projects a feeling of warmth onto the player. Then we have coziness in gameplay, often using a more therapeutic approach with simulator type experiences. Mechanics tend to be quite simple, but the game is unquestionably enjoyable to play. The lack of challenge can make you feel safer in a way. And of course we have music. Chill beats or even just the sounds of the environment you're in can evoke a kind of tranquility. So with all of these aspects of coziness in games, or even just one of them, you can feel like you're getting a nice big hug. Want a take that's nowhere near hot? Hotline Miami changed game music. Duh. So how do you follow that up? How do you take a megaton impact and be like, we're gonna make a sequel to this? The strategy was clear. More. More artists, more songs, more throbbing synth. Hotline Miami 1 showed every artist every time you quit the game. With Hotline Miami 2, that'd take you an hour. And that's great. The soundtrack is way more varied, more diverse. It has calms and spikes, valleys and mountains. It's an incredible three hour long roller coaster. You wanna know the downside? The downside is that nothing feels like it really gets to be special the way that nearly every track in the first game was. The downside is the song She Swallowed Burning Coals is played in one level for like one minute. The downside is that LT Grey makes a track that goes so fucking hard it might give people superpowers for all we know and all it gets is one minute? One minute. Have you ever noticed how weird Super Mario 64 soundtrack is? Hi, it's James, talking about a 24 year old game, but the point stands, Mario's soundtracks have so far stuck to a timeless big band sound, yet in 96 we have this very timely outlier that seemed to incorporate everything from bluegrass to polka to music. When you start the game up, you're annihilated by a jungle music rendition of the main theme. Here, let me crank the bass and put on cut your own. See what I mean? Or how about when you face off against Bowser and suddenly Nine Inch Nails kicks in? Nintendo and Miyamoto often find their inspiration in the real world, but I wonder if for this first 3D outing the developers made that connection more intentional by evoking popular music at the time. However, by doing so, it's made the soundtrack more unique and by extension more memorable to those who have played it. With Mario games having found their foot in since, you have to wonder what we may have gotten if Nintendo had stayed on this contemporary track. If you having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a b ain't one. This is a one minute clip from the longest TV program ever made. Aired in 2011 on Norwegian television, it was a live broadcast from one of the coastal passenger ships that sails the length of Norway, a journey that takes five and a half days. For 134 hours, using cameras both on and off the ship, the producers aired long uncommentated shots of coastal scenery. This is an example of slow TV. 
a genre that also encompasses train rides, wildlife webcams, and video walks. Slow TV gives us a chance to breathe, to see something as it is, without interpretation or editing. We're surrounded by an effectively infinite amount of bite-sized, viral-ready media. This is the opposite. Watching the world go by in real time, for as long as you need, can provide a welcome respite from a high-stimulus world. Did you ever think it was weird that in Space Cadet Pinball, pressing the up arrow key just kind of wiggled the screen? And if you did it too much, you'd lose your ball. Well, the reason for that is it is paying homage to the physical machines it was based off of. See, a well-designed pinball machine is one that can take as many quarters from your wallet as possible. That's why so many games include ramps that exit directly into here, here, and here. Basically, anywhere your flippers can't reach. But players quickly realized an easy way to cheat this. Push the machine at the right moment to steer the ball off course. Nudging is so ingrained in pinball culture that it's considered as valuable a skill as flipper reflexes, and a requirement for setting high scores. So how did designers prevent people from just doing this? Well, this bad boy measures side-to-side -side motion. Tilt a little too far and this pendulum completes an electrical circuit, sending a signal to lock the flippers, take your ball, and inform you to tone it down a bit. Okay. Pinball is inherently a physical experience, and digital recreations can't fully capture that. So next time you see one, try to play it like it's more than just a bunch of ones and zeros. Tabletop games are great. Glad we agree. My presentation won't be. Powered by the Apocalypse has its faults as a system, but has one of my favourite simple resolution mechanics around. 2d6. Monopoly loves these dice, but let's not hold that against them. In a lot of popular systems, you either fail or succeed, but more and more, mixed success has entered the fray, and PBTA is largely to thank. If you roll in this here zone, you succeed, but with unforeseen consequences. Think of it like the Resonance Cascade, albeit not as bad yet, over and over again. This is paired with game mastering philosophy that pushes only calling for rolls should consequences exist, so you don't hold a game for no dramatic gains. Again, like the Resonance Cascade. These two facets of play mean that players have a shared understanding of where drama can arise mechanically, and it won't always come without some forward progress. If a player wants to pick a lock into a guarded room in a system without mixed successes, your results are by you do or you don't, and how badly you don't is up to God. With partial successes, you can get what you want, but still escalate the tension. The GM is toothless in the face of success, and can still raise the stakes while still facilitating forward progress. Tabletop games are, to me, a method of collaborative storytelling where rules give us shared understanding, and to that end, binary success or failure issues a ton of great possibilities for how stories can develop. And I'd say this conclusion was a mixed success. I'm 28 years old, which means I'll be 30 in two years, and surprisingly, I'm still constantly learning about myself. A lot of my character development has come from a kind of surprising place, tabletop role-playing games. Sitting around with friends and dice and pens and paper and just putting myself in a different headspace has been the catalyst for a staggering amount of self-exploration. You create characters and put yourself in their minds, you take full control of them and you, you learn about them. Pretty much every time I've done this, which is a lot I've learned a lot about myself in the process. TTRPGs have given me a place to explore myself. My ADHD, my sexuality, the depths I'd go to to help a friend, and the depths that I wouldn't. When you have the right group, one of close, open friends, tabletop role-playing games can be a fantastic, safe space to explore all sorts of things about the world, and more importantly, yourself. So go play them. They say art enriches life. So then, why do we isolate it to its own zoned spaces? Put something that could be easily ignored in a context, a place we're immersed in, a home, our lives are there, and a new interaction begins. You change the space, you change its identity. Now murals can do this permanently, but digital art can do this mobily. The power in being able to redefine a small part of our world instantaneously. We're entering an exciting moment I really want to share with you. This is the beauty of digital space redefinition. All right.
Let's talk about Pitch Perfect. The climax of the story happens at the finals when the Bard and Bellows go up against the reigning champions, the Troublemakers. There are multiple narrative threads that bring tension to this final competition. The Bellows need to establish a new identity as a group, and Kendrick's character needs to repair her relationship with Skylar Aston's character after pushing him away, and then there's the more general conflict of the Bellows needing to outperform the Troublemakers. Throughout the film, the Troublemakers kind of take on the role of the bad guys, mostly because of Adam Devine's character, who is a massive asshole. However, just before the finals, his character leaves and gives up his spot in the group, which which takes away the main reason to root against them. In fact, I imagine a lot of people started rooting for them once Ben Platt's character got his big moment. The film builds itself as a competition movie, but in its final moments, it places both teams on a level playing ground. What I like most about this is that the film seems like it is going to be about the good team beating the bad team, but it switches it up at the end and centers the importance on relationships instead. The film is not about the Bellas winning, but rather about friends coming together, the groups embracing their various layers, and individuals being willing to change for the ones they care about. What I love. Hello, I'm Scruffy, and today we're investigating the Minute Murder. Here's a report from the scene of the crime. Hello, I'm the detective, and today we found precious little evidence of the Minute Murderer's handiwork save for four implements besmirched by the murderer's fingerprints. A bowling ball at the foot of the stairs. That was strike one. A knife, self-sharpening, not bloodied, but freshly buttered. A birdcage lying flat on the floor, the bird had flown. And a torn painting, a murderous critique of the arts. All of these are candidates for the murder weapon, but only one could have been used in merely a minute. We have no further evidence, not even a body. I thought this might be a wasted minute, but I never doubt the crime fanfare. I don't know what to make of it, but that's where you come in. There must have been a clue we've missed. Can you figure out which object caused the minute murder? And then I'm asking the, the question, oh, you, homo sapiens, you think you're good? You think you're intelligent? Can you survive? Because I'm asking the question, the fundamental question, hey, homo sapiens, can you survive like our ancestors did? Because I'm asking, hey, homo sapiens, <laughs> right. you think you're really intelligent? Uh -huh. Well, can you survive like your, our ancestors did? Hey, homo sapiens, can you survive like our ancestors did? Est-ce que t'es capable de survivre comme tes ancêtres, toi, homo sapiens, qui te croit si supérieur? Est-ce que t'es capable de survivre? Fundamentally, the game is asking that question. Hey, homo sapiens, you think you're on the top, you know, the pyramid of, of everything. Can you survive? I'm asking that question. Yes, what would I do? No, you, homo sapiens. Yes. You think you can survive like your ancestors did? No. <laughs> Everybody's telling me no. And that's the question I'm asking the players. Homo sapiens. Can you survive like our ancestors did? VR makes me sick. Not really. It's one of the coolest technologies I've ever set my eyes in. And I've only got a minute, so let's summarize by saying, yo, this is wicked sick chicken. But just as strong as the gaming experiences are the knots the shit ties in your belly. This is nausea like you wouldn't believe. It's, it's sudden onset, it's sweat, it's dry mouth, a loss of appetite, a dizziness, a disorientation, vomiting, uncontrollable shitting, and worst of all, it can last up to a day or two. Not everyone has it as bad as me, and there's motion sickness meds that I can take to help, but there's something really dystopian feeling about having to drug in before I plug in, about having to schedule the time I spend in VR to make sure I've got nothing important the next day, about avoiding staircases in games like The Plague, all because of the physiological effects this headset has on me. VR's wicked sick chicken, but it's also sick chicken. Buyer, beware. Want a drink? Yeah, can I see that? Here. <laughs> <laughs> Factorio is a game about automation, and something that I thought I had a decent understanding of, until I decided to try a Lazy Bastard challenge. You see, Lazy Bastard requires the player to finish Factorio while crafting no more than 111 items by hand, and almost all of those 111 crafts are used while setting up an electrical system in order to begin automation. While this may sound like the challenge is largely over at this point, it's only just begun. Factorio's early game becomes a trial of patience as you constantly flip what few assemblers you have in order to build infrastructure and ramp up production. 
in mid to late game, malls, and assembly area for commonly used items like conveyor belts and inserters are a necessity, and less commonly used buildings that are generally made as needed suddenly become inconvenient when you can't craft them by hand. In short, Lazy Bastard is the crystallized essence of Factorio, removing the easy way out of crafting by hand and forcing the player to truly engage with the rest of its systems in a more complete way. A lot of games make their worlds by using modular assets, basically a bunch of 3D models that can snap together like Legos in order to make a coherent architectural space. Unfortunately, just placing them into a map can leave them looking, uh, obvious. Now, you could spend time trying to disguise the seams in these environments and make them look organic, or if you're alien isolation, you could just lean into it. The game takes place on a spaceship built by Siegson, the budget competitor to Wayland yutani and as the player goes through, a bunch of areas start to look pretty familiar. But instead of taking the player out of the game, it sells the cheap, manufactured environment of the ship Sevastopol. Sometimes looking critically at level design orthodoxy can result in something really cool. So, uh, do more weird shit with your environment kits, cause, you know... It's fucking fun. This is a plug socket and this is Chibi Robo. He's low on battery and must charge himself in order to keep doing what he does best, cleaning. In cleaning, he's able to provide more overall energy to the house, thus feeding into a loop of cleaning, recharging and cleaning some more so that he can continue to recharge. This loop is compounded by the betterment of the house, improving the lives of those living inside, and seeing actual change as you dig a family out of poverty. You'll constantly obtain new abilities, improve the ones you already have, find exciting places and meet lovable characters as you engage in this core loop. It's poignant, it's fun, it's full of charm and surprises. So I recommend you play Chibi Robo Clean Sweep for the Nintendo DS, the Japanese exclusive sequel to Chibi Robo Plug Into Adventure, which saw a fan translation being released in 2016. A game which at the center is just about doing chores. Katana Zero conveys its visceral nature by evoking a sense of catharsis through game feel. It starts with the beautifully animated sprites that convey the kinetic nature of combat via movement and slow motion. The protagonist's ability to halt his perception to a snail's pace adds weight to every moment and decision. Touches like the muffled audio help sell the slow-mo given how starkly it contrasts with the game's otherwise quick pace. Clearing rooms without the use of slow motion is equally euphoric because of how fast everything moves, testing the player's skill. Like a delicious stew, all the elements come together for a tasty sense of game feel that has the player coming back for seconds as they rip enemies apart or die trying. Digimon Cyber Sleuth Complete Edition is the unexpected gem that gamers never knew they needed in their crowns. With 341 Digimon to collect through encounters and Digivolution, it offers the player a wide variety of potential teammates in their constantly rotating roster. Taking its chances by emulating PlayStation 2 era JRPGs, Cyber Sleuth provides a wide variety of ways to battle digital foes, giving you and your menagerie of monsters plenty of ways to complete the game. Each Digimon has their own unique battle move with an animation to go with it, and they have their own unique victory poses at the end of every battle, giving life to an otherwise hollow monster collecting experience. The creatures talk to you outside of your journey into the digital world through Digiline, and when in the digital world, they follow you around, giving you a sense that they are actually living creatures. Digimon Cyber Sleuth Complete Edition manages to create a believable world where digital monsters roam free and become partners to human tamers in order to save the human and digital world.
Video games based on IPs from other media have been a collaboration from the get-go. As an almost proud to call himself Weeb Weeb, it's a bummer that most anime games are half-baked arena fighters that focus more so on filling the roster with well-known characters than creating an experience that feels like you're interacting with the anime. While there are good anime games that create something fresh based on fan service or feel like you're watching an anime fight, the Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm series recaps the awesome over-the-top moments you can only see in the anime, and then do it bigger and better. Yeah, it's a battle arena fighter, but despite the simple gameplay, there's enough complexity to keep even Smash Bros players satisfied. Nuns, specifically 3 and 4, shine spectacularly in its presentation and how it delivers the ridiculous story of Naruto Shippuden without all the filler you'd experience watching the anime. If you ever wanted to catch up on Naruto but didn't have over 200 hours to kill, the Nun series saves you time and delivers an experience next to none in raw, hype anime cutscenes. Get ready to play the latest entry in everyone's favorite third-person shooter franchise. We never made tower defense games, I don't know what you're talking about. Battle for Neighborville is our biggest and best game yet. Play as one of 20 different characters on either the plants team or the zombies team. That's like six more than the last game. Battle against your friends in six multiplayer modes. If you don't have any friends, that's okay. I don't have any either. Play single player, where you can go into maps and run around for a few hours while shooting enemies. This is a game about shooting enemies. Most importantly, this is the giant gumball machine where you will eventually give us your money. In exchange for your money, we'll give you more content than you'll ever know what to do with. Spend hours in this game. Spend days in this game. Spend your entire life in this game. We will consume your soul! What the fuck did I just what? Crash to Insanity brought Crash Bandicoot up to standards too little too late. It introduced a free roaming camera to the series as well as the more open interconnected world. Levels are no longer connected with a hub but rather with a story, one which expertly skirts the line between compelling and silliness. Previous games avoided fatigue by periodically shifting playstyles, and Twin Sanity does the same with new playable characters. Those sections might not be as realized as the Crash ones, but they are short enough to never grate, and the world building packed around them showed just how much more this license had to offer. The Academy of Evil being a franchise highlight. Subsequent games all tried to find their own niche, but arguably none of them ever got it as right as Crash Twin Sanity. It didn't go for the hit gimmick of the month, it just made what the PS1 games did work on the PS2 and Xbox. It might be unpolished, but that's the definition of a diamond in the rough. Apex Legends is a title with some undeniably good game design, but today we're talking audio. I swear, dude, the guns in this game sound so good that I'd make music out of those sounds if I could. Hmm. Your time and your money are precious and finite. That's the intuitive reasoning behind measuring a video game's worth as a function of its price divided by its expected length. I can't fault anyone for using this metric when deciding what to buy, but I've often seen it used as the only deciding factor. I want to caution against this for two main reasons. The first is that it inherently devalues shorter games, which can be just as or even more meaningful than longer ones. Is a mind-blowing 6-hour experience really worse than an okay 40-hour experience just because they're priced the same? How many people have missed out on their favorite game just because the dollars-to-hours ratio didn't fit? 
The second problem is that people almost always have a hard time quantifying the amount of time something takes, especially when they're sufficiently engaged by it. As an example, if I'm doing my job right, you might not have noticed that the timer in the corner is running 25% slower than reality. As they say, time flies when you're having fun. So regardless of price, the best things in life are always over before you know it. If... if you really don't like yourself, how come... how come you talk on the internet so much? Best YouTuber that you have never heard of. Lurking in the background, music getting fewer. All I'm getting from this is a screw that's getting looser and loosen sleep from the question, what is it you do, sir? Like, uh, nothing of import. Rendering shit useless by the time I gotta export to a folder that features all of my insecurities. Hoping my packaged opinions even mean something to me. And I see y'all working, hustling, mastering the craft while I sit here envious, wondering how long I can last. What if I can't keep up? What if I can't come back? What if I'm an unremarkable footnote attached to your collective past? What if, what if nobody likes me? What if I'm not good enough? everything I've done. This is a plug socket. Imagine it had two prongs instead of uh, three because I'm a British, but this is Chibi Robo. He's not British. He lives in America or Japan, one of them, and they have two prong sockets, and he has a two prong plug, but pretends, yeah, we're pretending. So he goes in here, he charges himself, and he charges battery so he can, you know, do more stuff. And he goes around, he cleans stuff. He gets a packet of jammy wheelers from Audi that uh, someone's used up and thrown on the floor. And he goes, he picks it up, throws it in the bin. Now it's in the bin, and that charges the house's energy. The house's energy is uh, very important because if the house runs out of energy, well, then you're kind of fucked, aren't you? Uh, so they only have a limited amount of energy in the house. So Chibi Robo has to power more energy by throwing stuff in the bin, which in turn charges him... Uh, so he goes and charges himself uh, using that energy, which in turn lets him get more stuff to throw in the bin. And it's just a really cool gameplay loop, and you can play it in Chibi Robo Clean Suite for the Nintendo DS, which was translated by fans in 2016.